Um, so hi everybody, uh, Derek Ting here, and uh, today's episode of Upgrade, I have um, Michael Michelini here. He uh, has a has a podcast, and he's an, uh, an entrepreneur that has moved to Asia, and uh, currently he is kind of stuck in a quarantine um, in China right now. So uh, my friend Casey Lau reached out to me because he's been blogging about the process. So um, and, uh, you know, I, because I'm quarantining too, I'm, you know, definitely curious about um, what it's like over there because, you know, you do run the risk even here in Hong Kong um, that, you know, if you have it or they suspect you have it, you'd be moved to a facility. So um, how are you doing, Michael? Yeah, I'm doing, I think, pretty good. Um, you know, of course, there's been better days, I think, for most of us in the world right now, but, you know, do as good as we can, as good as we can. Before we dive into this, I want to um, mention that uh, Michael has a solution. Just today, um, you know, the U.S. announced that, hey, you know, maybe it's a good idea to wear masks after, like, um, for a long time, saying, no, 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 just, you know, it's fine if you just keep your distance, but now they're actually encouraging it. Um, yeah. And uh, I know that you had a solution for that. But before we get into that, I want to mention, I just want to talk to you first about your background and, and how you ended up in Asia. Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, I'm originally from technically Connecticut, but a lot of my, usually I say New York area in Northeast America. Well, um, started selling online while I worked on Wall Street. So my quick story people like to hear is I went from Wall Street to China. Uh, by selling online while I was working on Wall Street, you know, the eBay days, the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, website, web, web stores since 2004, 2005, I've had no idea how to do my own business, had no idea how to be an entrepreneur, you know, I thought I had to go to MBA school to learn how to be a entrepreneur, you know, I thought I, could, mm -hmm. I would do that after, after doing my Wall Street time and my MBA school, but kind of just fell into it. I think like many others that become entrepreneurs, you just kind of figure it out as you do it. Um, was that like course, a way to make some uh, extra money or something at first? It was like, oh, here's some side cash. I always wanted to do my own business and I just didn't know what to do. And uh, I'll be honest, I guess some people felt like it was MLM, but I, I kind of went to one of those uh, hotel seminars where they high pressure sell you to buy some kind of make money online. What they think scam. <laughs> I think a lot of the people there felt scammed, but I, I actually followed the, I followed the program. I did the mm -hmm. work, you know, like, yeah, I, I don't want to speak. I don't even want to bring up their name. I'm not good or bad. I mean, but most people like sued them and try to get their money back and said they were a scam. Honestly, I used their tool and their program to start my first e-commerce business. So uh, most people don't put into work. You know, most people want to blame the program or blame someone else. But I, I had no clue what I was doing, and I, I wanted to figure out how to do my own. You know, started buying from China in 2005, maybe 2006, while still on Wall Street. Um, making tons Early of mistakes, days. you know, so many mistakes, buying the wrong, you know, getting the wrong product, getting the wrong bad quality, miscommunication. So uh, took the opportunity in 2007 to quit, quit the job before the crash. But I spent about four months in San Diego, California. There was a little bit of an in-between. I didn't directly go to China, but basically it led me to China, um, sourcing from factories, selling online. So I guess you, you ran up against issues and then yeah. Maybe the solution was, I got to go straight to the source in a way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. Like, I just felt like, you know, especially just time zone differences. I, I say, you know, I'm up, I had a fifth floor walk up in Lower East Side, Manhattan, where I live with my roommate was my business partner and my hometown friend. And so we were doing the night and the weekend e-commerce selling, you know, working our day jobs. He had his job. I was working on Wall in a in a corporate bank and we were um, just making mistakes and learning, but I, I had no idea what I was doing, but it was mostly just difficult to be up in the middle of the night, being on Skype, being on Alibaba, dealing, not getting replies to your emails, not getting responses on Skype, getting slow. I think it was more about speed, to be honest. It was just too uh. slow. It was too slow. And then you had to wait for the samples, you know? So especially yeah. if you want to invent your own product, mm -hmm. you had to really explain it so clearly 
send it to this factory you don't even know on the other side of the world, hope that they don't rip you off and hope that they make the right thing, hope that they mail it to you, wait for a week or two to receive the sample. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's probably not gonna be right the first time. Explain it again, wait for two more weeks, you know? <laughs> so I just wanna accelerate the process. But I also started helping others buy from China too. So I was buying from my own e-commerce store you're going to laugh, but I used MySpace, you know, before Facebook uh, was popular, wow. at least I guess it was still only for college kids, but I was on MySpace networking with the other e-commerce sellers and they were like, oh, you, you're buying from China. Can you help me? And so I started also doing some sourcing, helping others buy from China as well as my own e-commerce store. And <laughs> when I moved to China, it's complicated, but my business, I had four business partner friends in my e-commerce business. So the sourcing was this, my own company. So I started a, mm. uh, like a B2B trading company for my e-commerce company as well as my own network. Um, but it's mostly with speed, to be honest. I, I almost was saying like, I was also kind of upset about there not being any factories in the U.S. You know, I couldn't make it in the U.S in the US anymore. There's not factories mm. in the U.S., I would, at least that I could find. So I felt like I was at a disadvantage and I could already feel Chinese sellers coming onto eBay, coming onto e-commerce, and they had a huge advantage because they're in the factory. So they could list That's the product yeah. and they could go faster than, than me or go faster than people in my position. So I felt like I had to kind of, I had to make that jump. I don't want to go down this path too far, but it is an interesting topic because I'm American too and I'm from New York. It, do you think we're just yeah. not willing? I mean, I was just doing something repetitive one one day and I was like, oh my gosh, if I had to do this every day, this would be, this would suck. You know, this is my thinking. Yeah. Do you think that our American culture kind of sort of keeps us from that type of hard work? Because, you know, Chinese people are willing to do those things. Yeah, I know. Like you said, this could be a long conversation. Um, I'll just, I'll just say, I'll just say on my blog, my personal blog, I kind of have a slogan that I like to give opportunities to people that are willing to put in the work. You know, I'm not going to say it's American or Chinese or Filipino or, or whoever, but I don't like people that feel that they're entitled to get something just because they are in a certain passport or in a certain location. You know, I, I want to work with and help people that are willing to, to work. You know, I don't want to just give handouts, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's all Americans, but unfortunately there is a trend of a lot of people in, in, in society that feel that they are uh, entitled. Entitlement is probably the most annoying word I've ever heard, you know? And, mm -hmm. and if you read between the lines sometimes in articles in the news, it's basically people expecting to get a handout, you know? So I, I don't believe in handouts. I believe in hard work. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, People can say what they want about Chinese people, but especially overseas Chinese that go to Chinatown and are willing to like get their hands dirty, work day and night, you know, make their whole family work. I mean, I, I respect that kind of person, but of course there's lazy Chinese people too. I mean, <clears throat> not all Chinese people are hardworking, but, um, but uh, of course there is this bias and it, unfortunately there is reasons for stereotypes, unfortunately, because there are statistics right or there are like polls and uh, and data that you could probably pull but of course there's not a hundred percent of everyone like that well i want to um thank you for that uh definitely good to hear your perspective someone who's like lived in the states and lived in asia because um you know even for myself living out here it, it enlightened me um as to what the world is like not just in asia yeah. but in europe and all different places um, but exactly. let's let's talk a little bit more about the quarantine process too, because I know you have a wife. Do you have, you have a child too? Yeah, I have two children. Two children. Um, um, so you've been away from yeah. them. What's what's it been like? How how they treated you? Um, uh, sort of the t passing the time, and um, you know, any kind of crazy, <laughs> interesting sure, encounters. Sure. I saw some stuff on your um, on your blog, which was would i mean if some um people you should check out his um his vlog but there's you know uh, a person in a hazmat suit and um i think most people would probably freak out if you're into that situation that in that scary. situation but it seems like you handled it really well with the camera so 
Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm thinking of maybe my friends watching this when I'm holding the camera. But yeah, it's really, it's been really, uh, you know, maybe by being overseas or in China, you know, in a foreign country for, you know, I for me it's been like 12 years, 13 years. I maybe a little bit more prepared for scary or foreign situations. But yeah, if you feel like you're in a, you feel like you're in one of those movies, like like those virus movies, you know, some people are, I'm, I have a few I don't want to watch. I haven't gotten a contagion yet. I, I got a Netflix account for the first time ever because I'm stuck here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I can give the high level. Of course, the hardest part was for me, I, I had just had bad timing. I, I left my wife and children um, for, for, for work, for a project for Amazon business I was working with and to Manila while my wife stayed in her hometown for Chinese New Year with my two children. Uh, um, my son is going to be six in May and my daughter just turned four. So, you know, it's also a really important age to be with them. And yeah. the plan was I would come, I would go between Philippines and China. It's not so far away from each other. And I would do some special projects because honestly, I don't, you know, I'm in the city I'm in is called Shenyang, China, which is Dongbei, which is the Northeast which mm -hmm. is like uh, kind of near Korea. There's even a lot of Korean restaurants. And it's, mm -hmm. you might notice I have a jacket on. It's cold here. There's no internal heating. So it's not like a place I would choose to stay. So basically it was agreed and accepted in our family that I would just go away for a while while she was with, with her hometown family and friends, which is, I think, somewhat normal, especially in cross-cultural, cross-border marriages i think even in in domestic you know us or chinese there's mm -hmm. hometowns and families so it just happened to happen when the virus broke out you know and i was uh, away and it was always i, know, like I, know I mean i went through months. the exact same thing actually um yeah well, i was in la i was in la it was already happening but then you know i still have to go work and the us was fine so and i've been going back and forth between the states and hong kong so I know what I know what kind of boat you're in. <laughs> yeah, even um, like Hong Kong, Shenzhen, or, or Guangzhou, a lot of people travel between the Hong Kong and mainland China borders regularly, mm -hmm. and they had to make yep. a decision which side of the border are they going to be staying. It almost feels like what the Berlin Wall going up must have felt like, or something, right? Like the walls are coming up, and you got to decide mm -hmm. what side you're going to be on. So yeah, everything is like so, uh, is, is collapsing, collapsing. Yeah, like the you. whole thing is just coming down on you. So you have to make a move. Where are you going to be for the foreseeable future? I mean, I don't know about you, but I have no idea how long things are going to be on lockdown. So I'm planning to be here for a while. But basically, we were deciding like January, February. It's like okay, Mike. You know, it's scary time for us because it was in China. So I felt really guilty because I'm safe in Philippines at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're in this quarantine, lockdown, virus, con you know, spreading country of China. So at that time, I felt guilty. And then it flipped. And then my wife's like, Mike, you got to get back here. It's not safe for you. We can't risk you not being safe. You have to come back or you should get back here as soon as possible. So, yeah, and the video is it's like a movie. Casey liked it, too. Mm. Casey Lally introduced us. It did feel like the world was fall falling apart. I was, I was, like, running and airports are closing and flights are being canceled. It felt like I was, like... It's in some kind of like a action movie or something. And finally I made it here after three or four different attempts, depends on what you count as a flight attempt. There was times I had a flight booked and they got canceled. There was times I couldn't buy a flight and I was in an airport. It was a nonstop, but uh, got here. And then like you said in the video, we land in the airport. You, you're on the, I don't know what to call it. You, you know, when you're about to open the gate to let you off the plane, you don't get off the plane. You know, they open the doors, but then these hazmat suits, the guys, as you mentioned, they have the white, full white, like quarantine clothes mm -hmm. with the goggles mm -hmm. and masks, and they just come onto the plane. And you feel like this is like some kind of nightmare movie where yeah. it's not like police, they don't have guns. It's not like, but it's still like, mm -hmm. they're just like got the trigger temperature thing and they're just scanning people. And everybody was Chinese. I, there was a few Koreans, but I was like definitely the only white skinned person on this whole airplane. And <laughs> It's scary. And my Chinese, unfortunately, is not still as good as I want it to be. So, you know, they're asking me, they're trying to talk to me in some kind of complicated 
medical terms in Chinese. I'm like, they don't speak any English. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. I'm calling my wife on WeChat, we voice and passing a phone in the airplane. And it's just, uh, and we sat on, we sat on the plane for two hours, you know, at the gate, you know, two hours. I, I timed this, oh you know, gosh. actually a little bit more than two hours. So, um, then it was like, basically it was a full day at the airport. You, we landed at 9 45 AM and we got off the plane at noon. And then we basically stayed until 6 p.m. in the airport between lines and waiting and questions and then grouping you into different areas. But I don't want to say there was any, actually, they were all very nice. I, I think most people I've been reading on the news, there was no rudeness. They were just nervous because of my their English abilities or shy or their, I had to wait extra because they had to find an English speaking, you know, work, worker to talk to me. And so there was a little bit of extra delays because of that but they were yeah. all very professional. And then, you know, they put me in a bus. They had, this, I mean, this like a whole parking lot of buses and those mm -hmm. white suit people, you know, the hazmats. And uh, yeah. they put you in a bus. To, they, they put me in a hotel quarantine that was as close as possible to my home or where I'm staying. So it's 20 minutes drive from my wife's family. Yeah. So they did that on purpose. So they basically grouped you into buses to be as close as possible to where your home or your final destination was. And wow. then, yeah, basically got here about 8 p.m., 7 p.m., March 23rd of 2020, and signed some kind of contract, you know, multiple tests, always taking your temperature. Um, and then just ch check me into this hotel room. I could show you on my screen. Basically, it's just a standard, standard hotel room. <laughs> you know, nothing. There's my bed. <laughs> And then I have one window and, uh, you know, there's a door and then they put a little sign on the door that uh, you're on uh, a quarantine. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm wired in here, so I can't maybe move out of my spot, but um, they put a date. So everybody outside knows, but the whole hotel is just a quarantine hotel. It's not like normal guests can come here. And like the second day I had a, a swab test where they put a, uh, cotton swab oh. down pretty deep oh. down in your throat for a coronavirus test it wasn't so horrible but it's a little bit dry and <laughs> and then i <laughs> you make it sound um <laughs> more pleasant than it probably is <laughs> yeah it wasn't so pleasant and then it wasn't so bad the they just shoved it up your nose and down your throat and <laughs> <laughs> which really which i mean this is a common test out. though this is what the covid 19 test yeah. is seems like so yeah so and then they came right into your room, like for that one, it was kind of scary because there's two people yeah. and they had, it wasn't just normal mask. It was like those uh, plastic, you know, like bug things, like those circular ventilators on two sides with the big goggles and they're totally masked, you know, totally like strapped in. And they just walk in your room with the boots, you know, and it's like, okay. And then it's, it's also my, unfortunately my Chinese isn't, it's still decent, but it's still like, I can't figure out everything they're saying and they're like, you know, literally it's the exact same chair and then they, they want your window to be on your face so they can see down your throat and then they're putting it in yeah so then that was and then i had a blood check a couple of days ago okay and i had to go downstairs for that so i haven't been outside of the oh. hallway more than a hallway the whole time i've been here mm -hmm. so i have a uh, 14 days i had to sign a contract when i came here that i won't leave until april i tried to put april 5th but they pushed me to april 6th and uh, so I finally got out of the hallway and then the elevator is like a stock room. Like there's boxes of water bottles and papers and garbage bags. You know, it's like, it's just like a, uh, and then you go to another floor and it's the bigger hotel room, like the, the suites with the two rooms and they turn it into like a doctor's office. So the living room or like the, the sofa area where it's like the, the extra suite room that's like a lobby of the hotel where they're like, they have all these papers and like office worker area. And they go into the bedroom of the suite. And, you know, the, I think people can remember like the nicer hotels have the extending desk that comes out of the wall. So you can have people on both sides. So mm -hmm. on one side of the desk is the doctor or the nurse or whoever is the person in that white suit that, and then I'm you are sure. I sit on the other side and, and then the other side, I have a, you know, then you put your arm on the table and they just do a, a blood test, like in the hotel room, you know, it's like, 
mm-hmm. uh, but they're very nice. You know, they're they're always. Um, and then I have a WeChat group for um, for all of the people staying here, and you have right. to report your temperature. So I use I use a digital one. My wife gave me. They were also joking because I don't know how to use a traditional one. This is the one they gave me. So the one that goes under your tongue, or uh, uh, this is yeah. your, arm, your arm. So under your arm. Is, oh, okay. I don't know. At least it's you... not a certain place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah somebody. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not fair. You can't do that fair. every day. <laughs> yeah. So this is. So I re- actually I probably should do it soon. But basically, I just take my temperature and I pop it into WeChat and I go into the group. It's, again, it's like a difference we could talk about. The Chinese have no problem with sharing their personal data to 60 other there's 60 people in the wechat group i think there's like five staff so there's like 55 or so tenants in this hotel room so they make you join the group there's no question you have to join a group and you have to share your temperature six times a day so some of my western like american friends are like i'm not gonna why you shouldn't do that that's your private data your temperature you shouldn't share your temperature in a group of 60 people right that's like your personal data they, though it though it's probably the same like every day <laughs> so, yeah it's no difference saying, but, but you know americans are always i mean i'm american you know we're both american but you know, americans are more about privacy and so yeah. but the chinese are totally like i don't care you can listen to my phone calls you can read my email you can read my wechat like that that's how they feel like with governments mm-hmm. or or uh, authority overseeing them so um well i'm sure yeah. all governments are all listening to us in some form yeah, or they fashion, all are, whether yeah. it's directly or indirectly <laughs> it's true it's true but uh, that's a real quick one um but you know we mentioned my birthday they used to let my wife deliver stuff so i have like a stash of stuff i don't know if you can see it but like she's been delivering yeah. all these extra food so they deliver oh. um they deliver every three times a day, they'll hang like fast food, you know, Chinese fast food, like the square rectangular plates with the rice and the, you know, different kind of meat and vegetable. But uh, she was able to deliver, but they stopped doing this because I think it was too much trouble for the worker, the hazmats, I call them, to keep uh, delivering to different people. So they could, my wife couldn't deliver any birthday cake or anything, but the staff, the staff knocked on my door and they gave me like a rose. Uh, oh for my birthday and they said happy birthday in English and uh, that was last night at my birthday so you know they're, they're 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 nice they know that it's hard for probably for me and everyone here um so I can't really complain but uh you know it's just obviously stre- annoying to be stuck in this four-walled room for uh yeah. two weeks I mean yeah well yeah I mean um I'm sure it's been more than a very unique and original experience, but um, you know, we're all it kind was, of quarantining in our know. own way. Um, well, other people for say. Us, but I, oh, I'm glad that you're. I'm glad that you're okay, though. That you seems like you're in good spirits. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, aside from just the strangeness of it all, that uh, you're being fed yeah. enough to. <laughs> you don't look. I feel like it's too you know, much three meals is too much, you know, and then my, my wife has really bombarded me. I almost was going to tell the workers to stop accepting stuff because she's being the normal Chinese, uh, mm-hmm. wife or person. They, they always buy too much food at a restaurant to, for their guests, you know, so I'm like, mm-hmm. please stop. Like there's too much food. Like I'm going to actually think I'm going to take this out of quarantine when I leave. So, um, oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I haven't been to China a couple times, uh, actually many times. Um, you know, they're very welcoming of guests, and they, exactly. they treat you very well. But um, yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> you, you'll <laughs> you'll be stocked up. Um, yeah. Hey, so I want to let's let's get to your um, your website. Um, sure. It has a very interesting URL. <laughs> Is um, but okay, I, I love to hear your feedback. Huh? Yeah, I'd love to hear. It's called loadpipe.com, which, you know, um, but I, you know, I love what, I love what you're doing there. So you're, tell me about what it does and, uh, and you recently just started it too, right? Um, Yeah. So yeah, so it was really just a couple of weeks ago. 
but it's one of those domain I registered in 2007 when I had just actually recently quit my job in Wall Street. I was still in San Diego, California at the time. And the logo, the business model, the ideas, the research, I did so much of that in 2007, 2008, 2009, when I came to China. It was kind of my startup idea then. Uh, the, the high level pitches to helping people do group buy to buy from China directly. And this is even before, or at least before I even heard of Groupon or any of these group buy websites or Tuangos in China, like, because I was a small buyer, like we mentioned earlier, I was buying from these factories on Alibaba and online. And I had no, uh, I wasn't a big buyer, right? I'm an e-commerce seller. I'm trying to buy smaller quantities. Uh, I wasn't like a big retail store. So the idea came to me was I need to pull together other smaller buyers and then uh, the name is load, you know, you load up everything and then you pipe it through to make it smooth for people because that's the name uh, came from. So, well, I love, I love the idea because actually from just necessity um, early on when this whole thing uh, happened in Hong Kong, um, a friend of ours was trying to get people to buy masks. Um, so yeah. she, so she got, um all these different people together to put an order together and then have it shipped here and actually you know what it never it never came to fruition it was just hard to do so yeah. there's definitely i mean immediately though that's that was you know there was a, a lot of um just even lining up here in hong kong for masks or for free masks and exactly. this type of service would have been like amazing yeah. uh, and I, I think today having heard the news like i think this is hugely relevant definitely definitely so can can so, uh so tell me can can other other people group together and then go and try to put together sure. an order for stuff like this yep so it's like like you said it's a, it's uh it's just really brand new so it's a in the startup world we call it an mvp it's like a pro closed beta so it's like a minimum viable product uh, I, I work with my team to put it together really fast because we need it right now so it's not open to the public because of that and and, and uh, but it is a closed beta so people can apply if they go to loadpipe.com and okay. there's a uh, apply maybe we could put your uh, your show as a how did you hear we have like a how did you hear about us or why do you want to join and then we're yeah. we're just reviewing those people and then approving once you're approved yeah you'll be allowed to see their members area where we list mm -hmm. the masks we list other covid-19 like kind of like ppe or these other products like um and what the way it's working is like you said people say oh i want to buy uh thermometers so the use case is a couple of days ago a member a new sign up says i want to buy my, uh, thermometers from china but it's a three thousand piece moq from the factory so mm -hmm. he was willing to he's willing to buy a thousand for himself or for his business but you know he's like oh can you guys help us maybe fill the two thousand and I, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, I know before we're recording, you're asking me if an individual could buy. It could be an individual, but we're kind of like a maybe Sam's Club or you know, like a wholesale club where it's going to be like a, a case pack. We're not selling like one mask. We're selling like a, a, a carton. So we have MOQ of, it depends on the product, of course, like the price mm -hmm. and the, the way that it's manufactured. But we have like, usually we like a minimum of like a carton or a wholesale order and uh, people can pay and the way the loading of the pipe works is we don't take your money until we have a deposit system and we we're asking right now for like a 300 dollars deposit to make sure you're a serious buyer mm -hmm. and then we try to load up to fill the group by moq or a minimum order quantity is how it's called so if there's like a, a hundred thousand piece masks or three thousand thermometers you could put in a $300 deposit to lock in your order to uh, for, you know, one case or, or 10 cases of thermometers or whichever product it is. So hmm. that's the, that's the main process. And then once we fill the, the minimum re required amount, we then would email everyone that's in that to say, okay, you can now complete your transaction and uh, fund your account to complete the order. And then we do the manufacturing. 
So that's why we need a system like this, like you said, because we need to track all these orders and we need to be able to communicate to all of these people. And then it's not just a one-time thing because we need to also give you the documentation for you to provide for your shipping, for your customs. So that's the whole idea of this pipeline. So people load up the pipe and then they, they stream the pipe through to make sure it goes through all the steps. So we're getting great feedback. We just filled our first group by, by yesterday. That's why we, on my birthday, I always, actually every year I try to do something on my birthday, like to uh, in business. So um, we were able to meet the minimum order quantity for the first order of masks. And some people already missed out on that. But the idea is for now, maybe every week we'll have a new group buy offer. The frequency mm -hmm. of the offer, we have to decide based on demand, the demand side. But um, mm -hmm. we are listing up a next week's offer. And some people want test kits. Test kits are really tricky though, you know, because <laughs> you probably mm -hmm. read in the news that some of the kits are faulty. So I, I'm really being sensitive and we're working on a process to make sure what we promote and sell on the platform is uh, quality because that's some their people trust us to vet the factory and the product. Um, right. And we work with our community. So of course I've been here for a while. So we have quality control, testing companies, shipping companies, and we put them all into this pipe and people can choose who they want to work with for each, each process or they can work with their own company. We, we don't force them to. Hmm. Well, I like that. I mean, I, I like the, your use of the word community and that, you know, maybe there's a community leader somewhere in the world yeah. that can um, put together an order because you don't want to be yeah. bombarded with like everybody in the world trying to go to your site and trying to order exactly. a bunch of whatever masks or, or uh, whatever, yeah. wherever it is they need. You just want like one main person who can kind of like coordinate with their, yeah. with somebody, so with their team or friends or. What's already starting to develop is some of the buyers are saying, can you list me on the site as a distributor in my local community? So if somebody buys the masks from us, we can, and they deliver it to LA, we could put on load pipe. Oh, you just want to buy one. You need it tomorrow. We have some distributor that bought these from us here, contact him or her. And it's kind of almost like, I'm all about the uh, kind of like open source. So it's kind of like an open source marketplace. So uh -huh. people can just have these hubs and maybe it could be a, a neighborhood or a school, like uh, a community buys this for their mm -hmm. local hub and then distributes it once they receive it at that, at that uh, location. But that's a little wow, bit that's later. amazing. But we're trying to we're trying to keep it simple, you know, the hard part, I think, you know, is to keep something simple. So right now it's more focused on collecting a group by order and then uh, collecting all the payments and then sending that to the factory and, and making sure it goes through. Well, that's a super, like I said, that's super exciting. I think it's, it's highly relevant and I think, uh, you know, it's going to help a lot of people. So, um, you know, I hope that, you know, people can hear about what you're up to. Um, and <clears throat> sort of find a community leader that um, might be interested in trying to source, um, you know, necessary medical equipment um, and, uh, you know, help, help their community. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to share with uh, everyone on here? Um, I mean, there's, I think, uh... I think maybe hopefully working online, you know, watching this video on your channel online. I mean, I think we all have to learn how to work um, from anywhere. I mean, it's, it's been a growing trend already, but I think, I don't know if you have an ex a timeline. I don't know how long this is going to last, but I just hope all of us can use this time to reflect about themselves, their, their business, their friendships, and also working more online, like learning online from, from, from your channel. Uh, learning from online courses, learning from, uh, you know, emails or, or blogs. You know, I think we all have to and learn how to work online. Uh, if people aren't doing it already, they should be definitely starting to invest in it now if they, if they don't already. Awesome, Michael. Well, it's great speaking to you. Um, to everyone out there, I'm going to put uh, links to Michael's work and how you can contact um, his site uh, in the description below. And, uh, I'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Michael.